Hello, Benita. Hello, Oi. Dr. Sharma. How are Lovely you? to meet you. Well, you are equally full wealth of knowledge as far as pharmacy is concerned and I really get inspired by yourself. Uh, I seeing... think we've been around a bit, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, because I've seen pharmacists who are very rigid, but I think you are the one who is very flexible and embracing different modalities of treatments uh, along with the pharma mm. uh, pharmaceutical drugs. Mm. Now, one thing which I uh, always want to ask you is that like uh, pharmacists don't deviate from what they have been taught, okay? And you have deviated a lot, mm -hmm. okay? In, in embracing uh, naturopathy medicines, compounding medications, and also you have worked, had your own compounding pharmacy for such a long period of time. So, what made you to do it? Wow. <laughs> um, look, pharmacy, I've been very passionate about pharmacy because I see that pharmaceutical medications are saving so many lives. They <laughs> are. But equally, um, pharmaceutical medicines have their limitations. We see this in the area of mental health. Sure. There's so many people that are unresponsive to their mm -hmm. antidepressants. As a matter of fact, the literature clearly shows that uh, Prozac has been responsible for some of the suicides as well, and that's in the literature. Yes. However, we've I found that um, if your body is able to make their own neurochemicals, then that comes from nutrition. Sure. My interest in nutrition actually expanded from the fact that I saw that pharmaceuticals had their limitations. So let's dig deeper and let's find, as a patient walks into a clinical door, into a pharmacy, what are the underlying causes behind where their imbalances are? And my interest actually developed perhaps not only from the, the concept of pharmaceutical medications, but also from the concept of having come from a sub-economic area in another country uh, where medicines were not freely affordable, we had to look at other options. Definitely. And the other options were natural options. Definitely. And each country have their own herbs and medicines Absolutely. and practices, you know, so Absolutely. and coming... Each culture yes, has come with their own plethora sure. of... Um, Remedies, I suppose. The problem with uh, modern medicine uh, sometimes can be that a lot of it is called as quackery or we cannot make a comment about a traditional healing method until unless we have gone through that and practice it. Yes, so, they call remedies, uh, as I call them. Usually, if we, if we want to make a comment about certain things, we should have enough knowledge about it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes premature conclusions are done by, by the uh, modern medicine and that's where dif difficulties come. And I've seen that you have written two books now. Second yes, book, I have. You know? I'm really excited to announce so, that I've written Alchemy of the Mind. Yes. Which is all about neurochemistry of the mind. Sure. And in addition, my very latest one is Alchemy of Amino Acids. Okay, that's quite interesting. <laughs> and I've actually gone through both of them. They are oh, wonderful. very, very enriched with uh, concepts and challenges person's current view, how they should be treating people and particularly... Uh, I was going through your alchemy of amino acids, it's a very heavy read, but <laughs> I've learned a lot of good tips from that and which I will be incorporating in my subgroup of patients, particularly addictions Wonderful. as we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, so what inspired you to do these two masterpieces? <laughs> oh. <laughs> After completing my uh, 20 year stint in compounding pharmacy, yep. I uh, decided to expand and diversify my skills base to incorporate functional pathology and I'm now working in this area as well as natural medicine and Ayurvedic medicine and I love Ayurvedic medicine because it incorporates some of the traditional cultures into the way we think and we eat etc. Sure. So the inspiration I guess has developed from um, the limitations of what we were and to see how people are actually responding to just a simple blend of amino acids, something like glycine, serine, ornithine, together with a bit of GABA, can make people sleep and get off their prescription Definitely. medicine just so yes. so easily. Yes. Yes. And, the, and just the fact that you can do this with simple nutrients, I then developed into compounding nutritional medicine okay. for an individual. Yep. And now I'd love to actually share that knowledge by teaching other practitioners yes. about it too. Yes, yes. And so, <laughs> so trying to spread the word that yes, it is not only 
the pharmaceutical choices there are a lot of natural compounding oh, all, amino acids all health practitioners whether they're naturopaths or doctors yes. or pharmacists they all are embracing some of these principles sure. because what we're doing is we're identifying sure underlying biochemical changes so we're basically balancing the body chemistries because the chemistries actually work in balance yes <laughs> yes that's now, how we operate you have said that you have started working with this functional medicine lab so where do you see these functional uh, testings can you expand on that so the functional testing is quite um, expansive. It's different to conventional testing, the conventional blood testing, yep. in that we can, in the case of mental health, we can actually identify the balance of the happy and the sad brain chemicals, which we call excitatory and yes. inhibitory neurotransmitters. Yes. And by identifying these imbalances through a simple urine test, we're able to identify what is out of balance, why is it out of balance, what sure. can we do about it, and why are they feeling anxious mm -hmm. rather than depressed and is there a dopamine or a serotonin depletion and how mm -hmm. can we rectify that yes. but not only that we can also look at the underlying issues is there a genetic predisposition towards is mother or father had these mental health conditions that the child is having so we're looking into and identifying uh, various genetic uh, polymorphisms sure. and they could be methylation they could yes. be pharmacogenomics yes. they could be neurogenomics understanding how we're looking at genetics yes. in terms of um, yeah mental health particularly through the family uh, history but then there's also other things you know you'll find that a patient perhaps uh, a, a thyroid patient somebody who's hypothyroid always totally adrenally stressed that stress becomes a precursor to the anxiety yes. and the depression. And stress is well known. It's like an inflammation to the body. It sure it is. is. As knows. a matter of fact, yes. in today's society, yes. if you're not stressed and you're not looking stressed, <laughs> you're not doing your job properly. Definitely. So yes. we are. We, we all can relate. And this is com something I commonly come across yes. that we see a lot of burnt out professionals. Okay? Mm -hmm. There's a very high demand to meet the Standards, so much adrenal standards, exhaustion. Yes. and together with that comes yes. autoimmune diseases. Yes. There's such a lot of chronic, complex inflammatory conditions out so there. So, is there any yeah. particular functional test you choose? Like, are there? Uh, I, I guess the easiest way to explain this is when I see a patient who is perhaps um, complaining with stress or anxiety or depression, I'd, I'd look at their stress levels mm -hmm. and I look at that through their diurnal patterns of cortisol mm -hmm. together with other hormones as well as their neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. But if I have, let's say we have a, um, an ADD, ADHD patient, I would understand, I would look at their um, nutritional components as well. So mm -hmm. there might be a genetic predisposition. I might have a look at cryptopyroles. Pyroles are a neurotoxic compound that's sure. found in the urine and it sort of mops up all the zinc and the vitamin B6 and so forth. And so patients will tend to have a certain pattern. Mm -hmm. Other components that are talked about, and it's all explained in the book, is okay. histamine. Um, histamine plays a vital role because histamine is in actual fact a neurotransmitter. Yes, it is. Hormones play a role. There's a huge connection between the gut and the brain, sure. hormones in the brain, thyroid and the brain. And, they, and this is all based on chemistry. Sure. So we can see that somebody who's perhaps hormonally deficient, perimenopausal patient who has um, a low level of progesterone, for example, low levels of progesterone will invariably deplete GABA eventually, yes. okay, yes. and in turn it will affect dopamine as well. Yes. So then they get this feeling of, I, I can't relax, I can't sleep. Yeah. Besides their hot flushes, they're yes. getting all those symptoms. And particularly in perimenopausal women, perimenopausal there's a big slump in the progesterone levels. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's not only the progesterone that is slumping and yeah. they're getting the hot flushes, yeah. but they feel irritable, they feel moody. Sure. They could drive a thousand kilometers, get in a car and drive when in their 20s. And now, just for them to get to the supermarket, they would reprogram their lives and think about things. So everything becomes an overwhelm. Sure. Now, yeah. 
considering your pharmacy background mm-hmm. uh, do you think that we have to be careful about certain interactions between absolutely pharmacological yes. agents and the nutraceuticals or herbals which we choose yes, yes we should be okay. and this is why it's so important mm-hmm. there generally there are not many interactions between pharmaceutical medications and herb, herbs or vitamins and nutrients mm-hmm. herbs vitamins and nutrients should be used with the guidance of a professional yes. because there is there are many vitamins available on the shelves of various health food stores but their dosage may not be suitable for you mm-hmm. or they the type of ingredient for example magnesium mm-hmm. may be available in a carbonate or an oxide oxide is great for 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 uh, if you want to get the bowels moving uh, uh, whereas the glycinate might be better absorbed sure. so these are the little constraints that we a professional is trained sure. a health professional is really trained to understand their nutrients yes. and each of these nutrients even though most of them are safe there are definitely inter- interactions between some herbs and some prescription medications yes. Yes. so you cannot yes. assume go to dr google and assume that you would be able to treat yourself this is why a professional yeah. is yeah. and based on my experience in this area i've seen arise that now like st johns of ward among yes. psychiatries uh, psychiatry arena is demonized mm-hmm. now st johns of ward is a mau inhibitor it's a monoaminoxidase you know inhibitor. so it's a, so yes. we know or we all know we don't combine mao with ssri exactly yes. <laughs> so if a person is not aware of that a herb can be acting like a neurotransmitter inhibitor yes. we can expect side effects so if we are even exactly. careful so what i'm understanding is we have to be careful uh, what are the primary medication the person is on and what could be the potential interaction with the herbal or other yes. nutrients you are adding yes now it can be those variations can also play a role like absolutely you know, so absolutely. usually so uh, if people mind. are very sensitive or they have very side effects are there how do you approach in those generally subgroup? with nutritional and um and, and particularly amino acids because amino acids and vitamins and minerals and particularly your methylating cofactors mm-hmm. such as your b group vitamins are very very important um constructs of sure. neurotransmitters so in order for us to actually make and fill up the tank sure. with neurotransmitters we actually need those constructs and those constructs actually come from our diet sure. so we need to be mindful of what sort of diet we need to have and in terms of interactions and and dosage adjustments yep. that is dependent entirely on the level of imbalance and what the literature is actually showing us okay Now, do you have any special area of interest where you uh I have just <laughs> developed I've just released my uh, uh-huh. book called Alchemy of Amino sure. Acids. So this is a particular interest to me because I know that amino acids are um fundamental to life. Definitely. Without amino acids we can't make neurotransmitters Definitely. or hormones get Definitely. the pu- heart pumping or Definitely. muscles moving. Definitely. So amino acids play a vital role in so many aspects. Yeah. We know that our DNA is an amino acid That's chain. Correct. That's correct. We we use growth <laughs> hormone, inject growth hormone that is amino acids. We use peptides, they are amino acids. Yes. We go to the gym and we take these huge bulking formulas, they are amino acids. <laughs> so, amino acids are not I'm not talking about those bulking formulas. I'm talking about amino acids specifically to um for its therapeutic value. That's correct. Yes. And in the literature that I have provided um I go through the properties the materia medica of each of the amino acids yes. and understand how yes. they affect the cardiovascular system or the yes. nervous system etc and how yes. you can actually uh impact yes. the uh, various conditions. So can so you we're... identify patterns of their imbalances through functional testing? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Can you elaborate on that like how So if you if you referring specific to a specific test or just uh like for example if somebody is coming who is fatigued or yes. depression is there and right, uh, right. so how would you so if somebody is fatigued um and there's a chronic fatigue mm-hmm. um we suspect that their mitochondria are shutting down yes. right yes. we have about 3 500 mitochondria per cell sure. and this is where 
energy is made and yeah. energy is called ATP. And they're okay. powerhouse of our cells. <laughs> they're the powerhouse of our cells, yes. 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 So to identify those metabolic blocks as to how when we take in carbs, fats, proteins, they're assimilated, they're digested, they're absorbed, they're metabolized and they're absorbed into the system. Mm -hmm. Once they're absorbed and they're detoxified in the liver and now they hit the cell, that muscle needs to move. Definitely. And in order for that muscle to move, we need those mitochondria to be jacked sure. up. Sure. switched on sure. and um, so we can use functional testing to identify any of the metabolic blocks all the way through that chain sure. till it actually produces ATP. So does any chronic infections or any toxins could play a role in that as well? Absolutely as, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact we find that um, gastrointestinal microbiome mm -hmm. is the seat of production mm -hmm. of some of our hormones, yes. including GABA and serotonin. Definitely. Now, GABA and serotonin are our most important, that's our happy hormone. Definitely. That's our anti-anxiety hormone. It's made in the gut. Yes, and yeah. serotonin makes the makes uh, the gut to move. Exactly. <laughs> serotonin <laughs> says, go on, get on, get yeah. on, get the peristalsis moving. Yeah. So we do find that um, getting the gut optimal, getting the microbiota optimal, getting mm -hmm. the good bugs, making sure that there are no pathogenic microbes in the gut, optimizing digestive capacity sure. because that is so important. You know, a lot of us are taking PPIs, which are protein pump inhibitors for yes. indigestion. Yes. And it is now well known, as a matter of fact, it's now in the literature that one should not use it for more than two weeks. Okay. However, it, it, it does affect yes. our production of hydrochloric acid, it affects the, the ability for the body to break down the very proteins that we need for our neurotransmission yes. pathways. So yes, infections can play a role. If you've got a microbiome infection, sure. that is going to affect the immunity in the gut. That immunity will then affect your capacity to produce um, as a, a good level of neurotransmitters. Sure, sure. But then there's also a, another conversation associated with infections. We're finding that there's a huge amount of people who have mold infestation, yes. Lyme infestation. Yes. And these are really Marcon's infestation, like, you know, multiple coag uh, negative, coag negative staph. And these are people that we are finding that they are, have autoimmune conditions, yes. often undiagnosed. Yes. And these are people who are probably bed bound for a long time. Yes. So we therefore need to take on board um, all those real constructs and we can identify them with functional pathology. And so getting hold of the right practitioner to identify all the constructs, we can then start balancing all these imbalances that sure. we see as symptoms sure. rather sure. than just band-aiding it with one symptom after another with a drug etc sure. mm. looks like this very complex areas you which you are talking about oh it's about. an exciting area <laughs> it's exciting now if, because if, we have solutions yes but if there is a new practitioner who is inspired by what you are talking about and yes. we are discussing as well mm -hmm. and they have to embark on this journey to learn so what would what is your suggestion? Like, have you well, been course. mentoring some people or <laughs> offering some been courses? I have mentoring uh, practitioners. I uh -huh. definitely do that. But there are some really great educational bodies. Mm -hmm. Of course, you've been mentoring me too, so that's great. <laughs> um, so uh, there are amazing educational bodies here in Australia that have um, provide this level of education mm -hmm. to the delegates and mm -hmm. um, I can men would you like me to mention yes. one or two yeah. yes at least people so should know about them if yeah, in case they want yeah. to research so there's anti-aging and regenerative medicine which is called a4m or a5m mm -hmm. there's AMA, there's ACNAM which is Australian College of Nutritional and Environmental yes. Medicine yes. there's um, an organization called National Institute of Integrative Medicine yes. and there are a number of other organizations as you mentioned Bill Walsh earlier yes. so there's the biobalance and the mind forums yes. Yes. so so there's some really great yes. opportunities for practitioners to learn yes. much more than yes. they, um, yes. if they want. And one thing which I've seen is there is no standard curriculum, okay? A yes. practitioner has to uh, develop an area of their interest. They don't have to take everything by themselves. Yes. Okay. So and they in can develop their own level of expertise. Yes. And particularly in mental health, I've seen that uh, uh, I make, I work like a team, okay? Mm -hmm. So those 
areas which are outside scope of my practice i delegate those tasks to my colleagues so like i don't uh, i don't specialize in treating infections or heavy metals or toxins mm -hmm. so usually i will uh, either identify those Refer patterns to people to the to the professionals yes. that yes. are experts yes. at it yes. and that's where you work in a collaborative manner exactly. okay from a psychological perspective it just you are sharing the burden because otherwise mm -hmm. what happens is it's quite overwhelming it for is, you as a practitioner is. as well yes. when you are dealing with chronic patients especially if they are not responding mm. you know yeah patients go to their gastroenterologist yeah. for gut issue or psychiatrist yeah. for a mental health issue yes. but as integrative practitioners we actually embrace them all Definitely. but we might have a special area Definitely. of interest so we need to okay. then therefore okay. um, allow patients to make choices of what's available to yeah. them yeah. and they say like nowadays the better terms for psychiatry is that future psychiatrists would be psycho neuro immunologist absolutely <laughs> <laughs> so we have to we cannot uh, we have to go back to our basics which we read yeah. and interestingly uh, now with the advancements of testings mm -hmm. uh, they are and very easy to and the capacity yeah. to tailor their nutrient profiling yes. for and very easy to understand once you start seeing very, the patterns and uh, uh, i think you are doing a great job and possibly uh, mentoring a lot of people and hopefully that we will be able to inspire more practitioners to join this movement because Absolutely. you know there is no world there is no country in the world who could uh, fund a chronic illness mental health or or even mental health bill you know so we have to right. we have to understand that the health purse of every country is being uh, I guess uh, burdened significantly okay. and so we do need to look at the other yes. options yes. and of course patients want to do that yes. too. Yes. And health is considered to be a bottomless pit. Okay. So which means that whatever <laughs> amount you put in it's never going to be sufficient. Exactly. So I think prevention is something we need to look into and mm -hmm. possibly mm -hmm. nutritional With approaches. a good science base yes. and a good evidence base we can do it. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice Thanks to meet very you. Very much. Bye. -bye.